Okay, is everyone ready? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as I said yesterday, what I'd like to do over the next few days is uh, begin by talking about the vow. Uh, talking about vow and then ritual. Uh, looking at building blocks of ritual, at least in the Soto tradition, and looking at ritual itself in a, in a broad way. And uh, I think that's partly what we'll talk about today. Uh, considering repentance as, a, uh, as an aspect of ritual, uh, as an aspect of vow, and uh, this afternoon, because uh, Adam's Jukai is coming up, so I, th I think that if we look at, if we together look at the Jukai ceremony, there's a, there are a lot of the elements of uh, ritual that we can see as independent and interdependent in those, in that ceremony. So today I'd like to kind of talk, this afternoon, talk through the ceremony and the various pieces of it. And then tomorrow, I think we're going to go into the Zendo, uh, possibly in the morning, uh, for sure in the afternoon, in the morning, talk about the Zendo as a, as a sacred space. Uh, and what are, the, what are the things that are in the Zendo? Uh, what is it that uh, wakes us up to the fact that it's a, a sacred space? What does that mean? What does sacred mean to us? Uh, and by looking at that, over the long term, what I'd like you to think of is like, uh, how do we create and carry around that space with us? Uh, and then tomorrow afternoon, we can actually start uh, pieces of a rehearsal towards this towards the ceremony. Does that does that make sense? Good. So where I'd like to begin, you've been sort of dipping in and out of living by vow, right? Uh, and somebody may have done this. You don't have to get very far into the book to uh, let's see, yeah, page. <laughs> it's the first page of the preface. Uh, uh, so, Shohaku-san is talking about uh, the temple, Katagiri Roshi's temple, uh, Minnesota Zen Meditation Center on Lake Calhoun, which is called uh, Koenzan Ganshoji. Uh, uh, Koenzan means uh, cultivating the clouds. It's a mountain. Zan is the mountain. Uh, Koen is cultivating the clouds and the mountain cultivating the clouds. Uh, Ganshoji, which is the, means living by vow. And uh, something that's, that Katagiri Roshi said uh, that's very powerful, very useful, I think. Uh, he talks about one of the definitions of Bodhisattva. And he says, ordinary people are those who live, who are pulled by their karma which I think is what Joshi was talking about last night. Our pulled, ordinary people are those who live who are pulled by their karma. Bodhisattvas are those who live led by their vows. Uh, so, uh, it's your choice. Uh, it's, it's each of our choices and it's our opportunity to, to help each other with that, with that vow. So to begin with, what I'd like to do is read a vow. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, Dogen's Ehe Kosuvo Tsugama? Oh good, not many. Um, this is uh, Dogen's vow. It's his vow of practice. And I think it's really beautiful.
it's part of, I'll just say, it's, it's something that we chant during the, in my experience, we chant it during the transmission process uh, every day. And I think it's part of the liturgy at San Francisco Zen Center now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, before Dharma talks. Mm -hmm. That's good. The whole thing? Yeah, we'll read the whole yeah, thing no, out. No, no, I'm this this yeah, they chant the whole thing before Dharma talks. So let's read it out loud. Ehe kosu kosu gamo. I just want to point out, I don't mean like on Wednesday when the speaker is there, but part of the practice period is chatted before every talk. Yeah. Uh -huh. We vow with all beings from this life on throughout countless lives to hear the true Dharma, that upon hearing it no doubt will arise in us, nor will we lack in faith, that upon meeting it we shall renounce worldly affairs and maintain the Buddha Dharma, and that in doing so the great earth and all living beings together will attain the Buddha way. Although our past evil karma has greatly accumulated, indeed being the cause and condition of obstacles in practicing the way, may all Buddhas and ancestors who have obtained the Buddha way be compassionate to us and free us from karmic effects, allowing us to practice the way without hindrance. May they share with us their compassion which fills the boundless universe with the virtue of their enlightenment and the teachings. Buddhas and ancestors of old were as we. We in the future shall be Buddhas and ancestors. Revering Buddhas and ancestors, we are one Buddha and one ancestor. Awakening Bodhi mind, we are one Bodhi mind. Because they extend their compassion to us freely and without limit, we are able to attain Buddhahood and let go of the attainment. Therefore, the Chang Master Lumiya said, Those who in past lives were not enlightened will now be enlightened. In this life, save the body, which is the fruit of many lives. Before Buddhists were enlightened, they were the same as we. Enlightened people of today are exactly as those of old. Quietly explore the farthest reaches of these causes and conditions, as this practice is the exact transmission of a verified Buddha. Confessing and repenting in this way, one never fails to receive profound help from all Buddhas and ancestors by revealing and disclosing our lack of faith and practice before the Buddha, we melt away the root of transgressions by the power of our confession and repentance. This is the pure and simple color of true practice, of the true mind of faith, of the true body of faith. Some reason it's, it's just uh, the emotion of that really hits me this morning. Uh, uh, there's a lot in here. Um, what's being given to us? What are our weaknesses? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very moving. Uh, so you you can have those copies. I thought I would tell you. A, talk about this a little and then discuss it because I think there's uh, usually there are <coughs> questions about this. We've got enough uh, fairly strong discussion about this on the way to the airport yesterday <laughs> with one of my Dharma brothers you know, around the question cycle. Buddhas of old are the same as we. You know, it's like, oh really? Uh, so, just let me give you a little background. Uh, I have not been able to find the provenance of uh, this piece, and I've asked a bunch of people uh, who would know. Uh, it seems to be among Dogen's 
writings, but it doesn't fall into one any one particular uh, locus. Do you know? Uh, I mean, I think Reb was. It's vague. not in the Shobogenzo, right? No, no. Reb was vague about it. Tigan was vague about it. Uh, and uh, I didn't have a chance to contact Shoaku Sara. But this, um, what it means, Ahe is uh, Dogen's name, uh, which means great peace. Koso is a posthumous uh, title, mm. meaning uh, founder. Like Dio Show? Dio Show means great teacher. Uh, Koso means founder. There are two founders of Soto Zen. Uh, Dogen is one, he's the Koso, and uh, Keizan, Zenji, K E I Z A N, is the other, and he's the Taiso, and I don't know what the distinctions of those are. But anyway, so that's A.K. So Kosu. it's not that he named himself. He didn't name himself. No, his, no, it's this, a posthumous name. And, and, and this, the this title then is posthumous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, Gan is a uh, vow. So, you know, when we do the four bodhisattva vows, it's like Shigu Se Gan uh, for Sa, se gan is four vows, and mon is gate. So it's the it's the gate the vow of vows, gate. and uh, hotsu means uh, something like universal. You know, it's mm -hmm. like the the universal gate that all of us can enter. Um, I think in the first paragraph where he says, uh, he alludes to, there are a lot of, there, there are quite a lot of, there are quite a bunch of negatives there uh, that upon hearing it, no doubt will arise on us, rise on us, which uh, implies uh, we have doubt. Uh, you know, nor will we lack in faith, which implies Oh, we lack in faith. And actually, he gets to that right at the end again. Uh, and that upon meeting it, we shall renounce worldly affairs, uh, which he talks about quite a lot. Uh, particularly, he talks a lot about it in his early work, uh, Dogen, when he was uh, mostly dealing with people who were in the world. Uh, and you know, who are struggling and figuring out how to how to have a balance between their practice life and their worldly life, as uh, most of us are. Uh, it would seem to me that it would be less dualistic if we would say, uh, we shall renounce striving in worldly affairs rather than renouncing yeah. worldly yeah. affairs. You know what I mean? Well, um, clean. Yes. Uh, It's a tricky question. Uh, how, for me, how accurate are liturgical or textual uh, offerings are, and how much we leave them in a form uh, that may not fit us, but that provides a challenge for us. You know, it's like it raises the question. What does this mean? What does this mean for me to renounce worldly affairs? Um, so this is always a conundrum, I think, as we're working with translated texts, because they're coming from a different context, uh, and also a different, uh, different set of beliefs and different set of, of principles. Uh, and we shouldn't assume that we are uh, operating exactly from the same principles. Of course, he says we are, you know, uh, as, as we get on with this. Um, and I think this, this second paragraph, and not to uh, single out Joshin, but uh, the second paragraph, although, although our past 
evil karma has greatly accumulated, indeed being the cause and condition of obstacles in practicing the way. May all Buddhas and ancestors who have attained the Buddha way be compassionate to us and free us from karmic effects, uh, allowing us to practice the way without hindrance. I think this is, this is kind of what you were talking about. Uh, uh, interesting, again, the word is strong, past evil karma. Uh, and it happened that uh, I just had a, a brief visit with Kaz Tanahashi the other day, and he's doing a book on the Zen chants. And we were talking about some of his translations. And, you know, I don't know what, what you all use, but in our repentance verse, uh, we used to say, all my ancient twisted karma, uh, and that was, some people didn't like that. <laughs> so it's now, all my ancient tangled karma, but the real translation is evil. That's, you know, it's like calling a spade a spade. Uh, it's, it's unwhole or unwholesome. Uh, uh, and, you know, there's unwholesome karma, there's wholesome karma, there is activity that is beyond karma which is uh, exemplified by zazen. It's non non karmic activity. Uh, although <laughs> we can we can we can create some karma in there. We're very we're very slippery. Uh, but essentially, and that's what you know that's what Dogen is talking about as zazen and as practice, and uh, and I that's what. Uh, what Shohaku was talking about in Living by Vow is that even if we are entering into you know, patterns of thoughts uh, in the context of our zazen, it's still, there's an activity that is beyond our conceptualization and beyond, uh, beyond karma in that. But in this vow, uh, It's an interesting, there's an interesting, I feel, logical connection. Uh, he says, uh, Buddhas and ancestors who have, who have attained the Buddha way be, will be compassionate to us and free us from karmic effects. In the next paragraph, it says, may they share with us their compassion, which fills the boundless universe with the virtue of their enlightenment and teachings. Uh, and so I'm just curious, what you think uh, share their compassion means. I mean, what does it mean to free us? I mean, what are we asking for? Asking to be freed. Have them free us. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I think it means that when, when, we, um, when we can actually see the our, the karmic effects in our lives, the tangled karma, mm -hmm. um, a compassion arises in, in us for ourselves or, or others that we may have affected. Um, I think that's what it means. But what do you mean, what, what do you understand the word compassion to mean? Well, the word tenderness comes up to me. Um, the word um, non-separation. Of, of this one and you know um, I think it's that we're actually sort of giving permission or asking that mm -hmm. they provide us with whatever lesson we need to, to, mm -hmm. to get over ourselves so. but and what's interesting is a share this present tense yeah, right. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I was relating it back to the uh, the first paragraph of that would help us to uh, be free from uh, doubt and faith, and I'm, I'm having a major problem with that first paragraph. Well, let's come back to that. Yeah. Um, uh, let me make a suggestion about the word compassion. Uh, 
uh, this is like what Suzuki Roshi said about enlightenment. You know, and somebody asked him, but he said, "You may not like it." Yeah. <laughs> uh, and to me, uh, you've been sort of talking around the center, uh, which is if they share their compassion with us, it means we're in for a load of hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, compassion means uh, suffer with, feel the pain of. So if they're sharing their compassion with it, it's like, okay, this is what I signed up for. It's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be fear. Uh, and so I, I don't, I want to be careful about this. In the culture, we sort of soften these words mm -hmm. and make them nice. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we really think about what, what it feels like, to be compassionate. I mean, there's something to the expression uh, breaks your heart. Mm -hmm. uh, empathy. Yeah. Uh, empathy, what's that? Yeah. Reading. Empathy is, oh, I'm reading something, some. Empathy is like, a, some, some psychologists have seen this as a stage of compassion. Stage. Yeah, it was like empathy is the mechanism by which you you actually, uh, but it, it's it's previous to compassion. Uh, compassion also has an I think an active and transformational uh, drift. Uh, that empathy may be just the initial feeling. I don't know. I don't want to get too tangled up in that. Well, I think it's good for us in a certain way to relate to this. And one of the things that I've been talking about is the tendency to dissociate yep. from suffering. And that's us. And it's an associative process. And everything we do is an associative process. So in this way, we're connecting with and right. allowing, dissolving that dissociation. Right. And the very word, the come in passion is with. Uh, and also just to say we we all know that doesn't can be a dissociative process. <laughs> yeah, well, that's Not, nobody nobody up. here, right? Oh, yeah, nobody no, here. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, that's not that's exactly what this vow, it's the vow of association. And in the next, you know, in the next mm -hmm lines, it's so, it's re this is a really powerful, Buddhists and ancestors of old were as we, we in the future shall be Buddhists and ancestors. Um, so, come back to Paul, your difficulty with. Well, I thought uh, uh, two things came to me, uh, that I thought in some ways doubt uh, was a driving force uh, of, uh, of Zazen and, um, and Zen, and I, uh, I thought that we could have uh, faith in ourselves, not in what someone else says. This reminds me too much of the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> I, wa I want to rip it up and throw it away. I can, I can understand that. But <laughs> what's the Apostles' Creed? It's, uh, it's a, a Catholic prayer that okay. says, I, I, I promise to believe in all these things that are not accessible to personal experience. Um, this may be related to that, but I was, I was reading the May They Share With Us Their Compassion. Um, it seems to me that they've shared their compassion in the creation of a lineage and um, a way of practice. And so to say, may we share may they share with us their compassion, could actually be saying, may we have the courage to face entering into this tradition. Mm -hmm. And so that it's, it's um, not so much blind doubt, but that the vow is, may I be courageous enough to enter into the stream which has been provided that allows one to face and transform suffering. 
Yeah, I, I think that's right. You know, so in Japanese Buddhism, there's a, um, it's, there's a, a dualistic, if you will, uh, framing of practice. Uh, some of the Buddhist schools are seen as self-power schools. Uh, Zen is nominally a self-power school. Uh, and some of them, like uh, Tendai, and uh, the schools that flowed from that, Nichiren, Jodo Shinshu, are uh, nominally other power schools. And uh, I think that and in this particular uh, text, Dogen is kind of he's bridging, bridging them. And uh, this is a this is tricky for us, I think. Uh, I I would if I look around this room, uh, I would venture that uh, everybody has a background has some religion of the book background, Christianity, Judaism, uh, and that most of us, is there anyone here who has an active uh, practice in those, in those traditions? Mary Allen was here, she <laughs> does. She does, yeah. Pretty she much. Still does. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, and those are other power schools par excellence, except, you know, then you start looking at the Protestant Reformation and you have the whole split over faith and works, uh, which is just another way of framing the same split. So a lot, a lot of us are really understandably uncomfortable with something that smacks of other power, which I, I think is what you yeah, that's what, I, that's yeah. what yeah. Yeah. exactly yeah. right. So, but for me, what I what I've thought over the years, because initially I had that uh, I had that perspective as well, and I'm sort of fleeing a highly dysfunctional Jewish background, uh, and then there's the mystery. How did we get in this room? You know, it's like, yes, we had to drive here. We had to, well, we had to do a lot of shit, you know, but here we are, 10 or 11 of us, in this room. And how we got here is completely beyond my understanding. And so I'm willing to admit kind of the mysterious working of you could say other power, or power beyond my understanding. And that's at least... Well, uh, could you also frame it as action beyond my awareness? Yeah. Karmically. Yeah. And, and so we don't have to have any notion of a mist... Because when you put it that way, it almost sounds mystical to me. Right. Well, how I'm meaning it is mystical. Uh, how Dogen meant it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, how literally uh, that was... That was the atmosphere that they breathed. You know, that was the culture that they, culture that they were in, where they, uh, they were critically examining, and he was very critical, and all the people of his, all the major religious figures of his time there in the early 13th century were, they were reframing Buddhism, uh, in accord with what they thought worked, and. Um, but what their overall larger uh, container of their their vision of the working of the universe, it, it's I don't know it, you know, and we're not living it. Yeah. Um, one of the books I brought down here to read while I was here was recommended by somebody, um, which is a it's a book about the twelve step program that's kind of sacred recovery, like taking it beyond a particular addiction and being able to to work the steps even if you don't identify as a particular addict. And 
the very first step, which is as far as I've gotten in this book, is I have no control. <laughs> and all the different ways that that plays out, like this is the first step. And that's what I can't, that's what I can't help but hear that in reading this, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, it, it's a struggle. In fact, I'll tell you a little bit more. The person who wanted me to read this book wanted me to start a group that she could do because she did not want to do a regular 12-step group because she did not want to identify as an addict. And I was like, and as I'm reading this, I said, well, you don't want to identify as an addict, but in the very first step, we have to give up all control. So what's the problem, you know? I mean, if we're going to go there, who cares whether you say you <laughs> can't <laughs> stop or not, you know? Yeah. So um, it's interesting. I mean, in other words, there's a struggle there to admit that you have no control. Right. But you and have to have some. I mean, that's what this is about. Yeah, right. and this you is so. Can't this is, yes, this is a, some way to resolve. I think those two, like you were saying. Right, and that's you know, uh, in the course of, uh, we're we're going to bring this in a way to questions of ritual, which which are about uh, controlling <coughs> the uncontrollable, yeah. or what finding a channel for the uncontrollable to to flow. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder, I can't believe I'm saying this. I want to go back to the language. I never say. But I'm thinking from Paul's question again, we vow with all beings from this life on throughout countless lives. The first thing is to hear.